Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Kareem George. I'm the principal of Culture Traveler, and I'm so excited to be joined by my esteemed colleagues at Abercrombie and Kent today, Kim Gamaris, Marty Baer, and Kirk Reynolds. And today you're tuned into California, Wine Country, and Beyond. This is actually the third webinar we've done with Abercrombie and Kent. If you missed the previous two, they're on our YouTube channel. So I hope that you'll subscribe and tune in to learn more about Morocco and also luxury travel post COVID-19. Some quick housekeeping before we get started officially. If you haven't already, please mute yourself during the presentation. We'll have time for questions during the Q&A at the end or you can may enter them into the chat. And then right now, just so that I can make sure you can all see and hear me, go ahead and type into the chat your favorite California wine. So please just go ahead and do that so I know that everyone's tuned in and can hear. And today we're going to start with an overview of Abercrombie and Kent's service and safety standards, followed by a very high level look at what the exciting new office in the US can do. And then we're going to jump right into our focus, which is California and the wine country. So without further ado, I'd love to turn it over to my dear colleague, Kim Gamaris. Uh, thanks so much, Kareem. It's always so wonderful to see you and have an opportunity. I, I love having this opportunity to meet your clients uh, almost face to face. You know, Zoom gives us a better opportunity to do that sometimes, I think. So hello to all of you and welcome. Thanks for taking the time to join us tonight. Really, truly appreciate it. So um, as Kareem mentioned, I am the sales director for Abercrombie and Kent. We work very closely together, Kareem and I, um, in curating uh, all the journeys that he plans for you folks around the world. And I always think that it's nice, even though we're focusing on one particular area, to just take a minute and remind everyone, um, you know, of exactly what it is that Abercrombie and Kent offers. Um, so with that said, um, Abercrombie and Kent was founded in 1962 by Jeffrey Kent and his family uh, in Kenya, just outside Nairobi, Kenya, um, with, you know, one truck and his mother's borrowed silver service from her uh, dining table to create luxury safari vacations. Um, and Jeffrey uh, is still at the helm of Abercrombie and Kent today. And I'll tell you guys, he is just as passionate about creating unique travel experiences around the world as he was in 1962 uh, when he founded the company. And so what's really nice about that is that means that we have had a consistent leadership and a consistent standard standard of quality throughout the world as we've grown from that one safari truck and one safari that we offered in 1962 to having over 55 offices around the world now. So I don't mention that um, in a braggadocious uh, manner. I'm, why is it important to you as a traveler? It's important because by developing those 55 offices around the world, that means that when you're working with Abercrombie and Kent and when you're traveling with us, we more than more often than not are actually the people on the ground. We're the company on the ground delivering the services to you. We are there, we have our finger on the pulse of what's happening politically, um, socially in the community. We have local connections uh, that can, can open doors for you. Um, it also means that those 55 offices uh, guarantee you a standard of safety and security around the world. So we have global standards that have been established. We can take you to over 100 countries. We visit all seven continents with A and K. So one of the things that Kareem and I were chatting about, you know, through the last several months was, you know, why it's important for folks to consider, um, you know, a company like a &K right now. And I mentioned we started in 1962 and with nearly 60 years of experience in luxury travel, that means that we have weathered storms. We, we know how to navigate challenging times and help our clients and our, our travel partners navigate those times. I mentioned those 55 offices and I think the, the, one of the really important things right now um, in the world, travel world that we're, we're 
living in is that it also gives us the ability to very quickly on the spot adapt when things change. And I think we all can agree that there have been several changes, you know, over the last several months. So whether that's countries opening and closing and, um, you know, requirements and mask wearing, you know, Abercrombie and Kent, our offices are right there. So we know we can make the adjustments on the ground for you. There's always someone there 24 uh, seven to assist you. We've got guaranteed departures. We couldn't offer more flexibility and when things do go bump in the night and you know you need to come home from a country unexpectedly as we all experienced earlier this year you know we're right there grabbing the last four seats out of morocco on a uh, royal air morocco or whatever airline we can get we are um we are chartering aircraft uh back home from south america as we did to get guests home so you can rely on us during times like this and i think that's important to know i think as we all look at at the future and it means that we're there uh, to create and think about what that future looks like and we're well positioned to offer new opportunities for you. So lastly, um, I just want to share that if you folks are interested, if there's anything we see today or as you're talking with Kareem over the next month or so, um, we've also introduced a new book with confidence uh, policy so that if you wanted to start planning and dreaming about places to go in the future, you can book right now. And if you need to make a change due to a COVID related reason, whether that's here at home or in the destination that you're traveling to, we would allow you with a 30 day notice to postpone that trip. We would just issue a future travel credit for you and allow you to travel through the end of December 2022, complete flexibility and to choose any destination that we travel to. So again, it just speaks to that flexibility during times like this. So we hope that's something you'll consider. And with that, um, I think we talked about the fact that we go to over 100 countries in the world, um, but what is really exciting is that I love the fact that we have seen this um, interest, this, this um, uh, rebirth, if you will, uh, of USA travel. I think it's always been there, um, but I think folks know us for those inter international destinations. And I'm not sure what little, you know, genie sat on our shoulder last year and said, hey, it's time for Abercrombie and Ken to open their own USA office. Um, but we had the foresight to do that at just the right time. Um, and the gentleman that I'm about to introduce you to, we've had the pleasure of working with for years at Abercrombie and Kent um, and helping us curate those US trips. And so we decided last year it was the time to um, bring them on board, you know, from owning their own companies and operating their own companies to saying, hey, come on, you know, we've worked together all these years. Let's let's make it official now. Join join our team uh, instead. So with that, I'm very happy to introduce uh, Kirk Reynolds, our uh, operations manager for Abercrombie and Kent USA, and Marty Bear, our managing director for Abercrombie and Kent USA, who'll be delivering the presentation today. And you know, you may have even uh, seen or heard Marty if you've been uh, following some of the news as they're talking about travel these days. I know he's he's made appearances in the last four months with this, you know, rebirth of interest in U.S. travel on the Today Show, been quoted in Forbes and Condé Nast. So I just want to encourage you guys at the end of this, you know, you're, you're, you're um, spending some time with two of the, you know, preeminent uh, experts in the industry on U.S. travel. So if there's anything you want to ask about domestic travel, you've got the two gentlemen who can answer the questions for you. So with that, I'll turn it over to Kirk and Marty. Thanks, guys. Well, let me, thank say, you. let me just say a couple of words, Kirk, before you start, sure. Kirk, you start the presentation. Uh, as, as Kim said, we, we opened the USA office in Boulder, Colorado uh, in August of 2019. Uh, ANK was foresighted in deciding to have a USA DMC after 60, almost 60 years with uh, operating all over the world, including the U.S., but always operating in the U.S. with third-party suppliers, including companies that I owned that were third-party suppliers and that Kirk owned, which were third-party suppliers. So uh, this is a new world. It came at an appropriate time, a good time for AMK, because with COVID, there's been a great interest among Americans in traveling domestically. And uh, now we're all set to assist 
those who are interested in traveling domestically, especially uh, in the national parks, Alaska and California, which are our three most important destinations. So I'm going to turn it back to Kirk, who will introduce you to what we do, and then I'll uh, take over toward the end about uh, California wine country. Yeah, thanks so much, Marty and Kim. What an intro. We just set the bar incredibly high for us to try to live up to. I appreciate that. So, yeah, I'm going to give you an overview of what our DMC does, just on a high level. You know, tonight's about California wine country, and Marty's going to go through that. But I also want to share some uh, slides about our national parks. That's a great picture of the Bison in Yellowstone National Park. Alaska has been very popular this summer. And then that's also a great coastal shot of California. Um, so we'll just take you to, through a few of these slides just to give you a sense of what opportunities there are in domestic travel. And I got to say, I'm especially excited to see Americans wanting to travel within the United States. I think it's fantastic that people want to discover what's in their backyard. Um, and there's so much. We have a vast, diverse, and beautiful country that is just ripe for exploring. So on this slide, we just want to point out the nature of our travel. Uh, we've been operating a lot of private jet programs, especially in our national parks. So you can hop from national park to national park in the safety of your own jet. The properties that we use, this is a great shot of the Amagari in Page, Utah. The properties that we use are small boutique properties so that you have your own unit and you have a sense of security and safety. And then we also have a number of private yachts uh, and this is one uh, station on the Alaskan coast. Um, also, just to give a shout out to an extension of our team. Um, as you know, as you travel around the world, it's really about the guides who make the experience. They bring the destination to life. They bring the history to life. They help you connect to the culture of what you're seeing and experiencing. Um, and our guides uh, are absolutely exceptional in, in their field. They are professional wildlife photographers, historians, uh, the gentleman on the left here is Mr. Wayne Rainey. He is a geologist. Uh, he wrote the book Carving the Grand Canyon. So naturally his, his focus is on the Grand Canyon, that area. And so if you come with us on a trip to the Grand Canyon, you get paired with Mr. Wayne Rainey and he just does a fantastic job uh, bringing the Grand Canyon to life and giving you a, a sense of time and place and history uh, of the area. Um, so today we're just going to point out a few of our favorite destinations. Of course, we're going to focus on wine country with Sonoma and Napa Valleys, but also talk about Yellowstone and Grand Teton, uh, Grand Canyon, uh, as well as uh, Arches and Mount Rushmore National Parks. So just a, a couple slides on, here's one of Grand Canyon, just to kind of help you understand how A&K operates a trip versus, um, you know, the general public or other companies. Uh, the Grand Canyon is a very popular destination uh, for a lot of people. To make it special for our guests, we have a private entrance that we go into the side, we skip the long lines that uh, are required to get in, into the national park. Our guides are very well versed in the area and they, they love to take their guests to off the beaten path areas. And so while there are specific viewpoints that the general public goes to, our guides like to steer you away from those areas and go to spots that make you feel like you have the Grand Canyon all to yourself. Um, and it's such a, a vast and beautiful site. It really is special to, to have that feeling of uh, you know, having it all to yourself. And if you're still thinking about traveling this fall, um, Grand Teton National Park and Yellowstone National Park uh, in Wyoming, just a beautiful uh, place to go to in September, even October. This picture was taken in the fall. You can see the birch and the aspen trees turning colors. Uh, the wildlife is migrating, the elk is bugling. Marty and I were there uh, last September and just, you know, we were driving around the area and could not stop, could not stop stopping uh, and taking pictures of the, of the beautiful scenery. Um, so uh, as this time when most people are not, are traveling to these areas in the Northern Rockies, we really love taking our guests to the, to the Northern Parks. Another way to see the national parks is our National Parks by Air program. So this is a, uh, a, an itinerary set up. So if you have your own jet or if you're part of a NetJet membership, um, or if you'd like for us to charter a jet for you, it's just a great way to see our country's national treasures. So we get to see Yosemite National Park, the Grand Canyon, Yellowstone, and then we see Arches National Park in Utah. It's called the Big Three. Uh, that is Yosemite, Grand Canyon, and Yellowstone. 
And in this way, you get to see the three greatest national parks in our country in just in a week. Our guides pick you up directly from the airplane, whisk you away on some amazing national parks adventures, staying in beautiful accommodations. Uh, and again, you can do it all privately uh, and safely. Um, on the other side of the country, um, especially now, this is becoming a very important destination as the leaves will be turning in the coming months. Um, we love operating trips all along the coastal Maine, uh, all the way up to Acadia National Park and the beautiful towns along the way, Vermont, New Hampshire. Um, and again, we do it all on a private basis. Um, as well as the South, so going through Cape Cod and Nantucket, we have some great sailing programs um, and uh, just a, a great way to see the national or these areas uh, on a private basis. And then through the Berkshires, um, probably one of my favorite destinations when it comes to fall foliage, the charming towns um, and galleries and boutique shops you get to visit along the way. Our guides know how to take you to places where the crowds don't go. I think that's a really important feature. Um, and, uh, and we love going this area late September all the way through the end of October. You know, typically the first and second week of October is the prime time to be visiting the Berkshires. Um, we've also designed some regional itineraries. Uh, so just anticipating that commercial air travel is going to take some time for people to be comfortable um, doing. We've created some road trips. And so these can either be self-drive, so you use your own vehicle, um, or you can have a private driver guide pick you up directly from your driveway uh, and take you away on some uh, amazing adventures. So we have uh, itineraries through New England, uh, the Southwest going around the Grand Canyon, Zion and Bryce, um, around the Great Smoky Mountains in the Southeast, and then a new one going from San Francisco all the way up to the Redwoods in Southern Oregon. Um, we also have larger cross-country road trips, and you know, this is uh, a great uh, example of one departing from the Midwest. Uh, this one happens to be departing from Chicago, but it can really depart from anywhere. It can go from Detroit. Uh, this is taking Route 66 and following that classic that journey all the way to the Santa Monica Pier in uh, California. Um, hey, again, just a couple of comments here, Kirk. Sure. Yeah. So uh, I'm from Chicago myself. I've driven Route 66 uh, twice in its entirety and portions thereof other times. And um, I, it's a great historical route. It's no longer the main way to get from east, east to west now that we have interstate highways but it's the most uh, picturesque and colorful. And I just wanted to give you some examples of the way in which we do Route 66. Uh, you know, you start in Chicago. In fact, the sign that says end the Route 66 is at the Santa Monica Pier. The sign that says beginning is at the Art, Inst Art Institute of Chicago, just across the street from the Art Institute. And the first day out is in Springfield, Illinois. And uh, there on, our, on the first evening, uh, we, our, our clients have dinner with Abraham Lincoln. Now, not everyone in, has been able to do that, at least in the last hundred years or so, but um, we work with the, the best of the Lincoln impersonators there in Springfield, Illinois, which is where Lincoln was an attorney. And we have the dinner in a, a home built in 1853 in which Lincoln, in fact, did dine. And Lincoln and his wife and Ulysses S. Grant and his wife are in costume and character for a dinner that's characteristic of the, uh, of the time. So that's just an example of the kinds of things we do along the way. There are several national parks along the way, including Petrified Forest National Park and the Grand Canyon, right on the route. And then just off the route, there's some other possible other parks as well. Um, when we're in the Southwest, we have a relationship with one of the uh, Native American elders in New Mexico to do an evening program on Native American cultures of the Pueblo people. So uh, we have our own sort of built-in insider uh, ideas and of course the national parks and other uh, major na uh, natural wonders along the way. Sorry, Kirk, go ahead. All right. My Marty, turn. you want to take us through California? Yes, so California is one of our most important destinations. There are eight national parks in California, including the Redwoods, which is shown on the lower left and the Yosemite, which is shown in the center picture. Uh, but we do more than the national parks in California. We do the great cities, San Francisco, Santa Barbara, Los Angeles, San Diego. Um, and we also do uh, the coast and trips along the coast, which is shown on the upper 
picture here. And then, of course, we do a lot of focus on the wine country shown in the upper left. So what we're putting together typically are, pick, are, are trips that combine these areas. Just to give you one, some ideas of what we do along the California coast, the California coast is one of the most wonderful trips along Highway 1 between San Francisco and Los Angeles. Uh, and we have a lot of wonderful nature along the way. The Monterey Bay area uh, and Monterey Bay itself was made a national marine sanctuary in 1985. And since that time, it was just blossomed with marine life. Uh, now the humpback whales, one of which you see here in the lower right, no longer do all of them migrate to Alaska from, from Baja, Mexico. Now about 15 or 20 of them each year peel off and spend their whole summer from about March to October in Monterey Bay. So the whale watching there is spectacular during that, during that time. We also have a, a slough off of Monterey Bay called the Elkhorn Slough, which has sea otter colonies, rafts, they call them rafts of sea otters. And we have kayaking and um, motorized rafting trips to see the sea otter. So it's a wonderful marine wildlife haven along the coast. The horses are from a ranch, a 1600 acre ranch above San Luis Obispo which is preserving the wild horses of the American West. There are about, or there were about 20,000 wild horses out in the plains of Wyoming, Nevada, and other parts of the West. Um, they have been removing and slaughtering some of the horses because the populations have gotten so large. But one of the, a, a, a conservation organization we work with is saving the wild horses from slaughter by, by convincing ranchers private ranchers to take wild horses onto their lands instead of grazing cattle. And so this is one of those ranches that has 80 wild horses that go charging across the hills above San Luis Obispo with the Pacific Ocean as a backdrop. It's a spectacular site. We go in four wheel drive vehicles, have a nice picnic under the oak trees. Uh, it's a spectacular uh, stop there in San Luis Obispo along the coast. So those are just some of the examples of things we do there. There also is some good wine now along the central coast of California. Uh, so that's, that's, a, um, that's another addition to this, uh, the coastal, uh, coastal trips, okay? And then our Northern California trip, which is shown on the map on the upper right, is one of our most popular. And often it includes the extension to the north to the wine country, but the Yosemite, Monterey, and up to San Francisco in a loop is a very popular driving trip. Again, can be done with your own self-drive or with a private car and driver guide. And oftentimes the wine country is added just a little bit north of San Francisco. Okay. And now we get to the uh, sort of part of the show that we wanted to uh, focus on, which is the California wine country. I am lucky enough to have a home in the Sonoma Valley. So I uh, do know the Sonoma Valley quite well. I also get over to the Napa Valley, which is only about 20 minutes away quite frequently. Uh, and we have a huge focus in our new North American uh, operation on wine country trips. The um, trips to the wine country, uh, you know, tapered off again, as did most travel, even domestically between mid-March when the, when the lockdowns for COVID started to happen uh, until the end of May, but until the middle of June actually. But starting from the middle of June and continuing now, the wine country has really opened up and both you know wineries restaurants in wine country and hotels have all adapted to restrictions that exist but uh, we're you know the wine country is doing quite well now in terms of tourism because of those adaptions so for example at the present time all restaurants are serving outside only there is no inside dining but fortunately almost all the restaurants in the Napa and Sonoma Valleys had large outside seating in any case, and so are able to accommodate quite a few people socially distanced at the restaurants. Also, because we're close to Silicon Valley and tech, we have um, some, um, some methodologies that are taking place at the restaurants that are making it a lot safer. So for example, almost every restaurant in Napa and Sonoma Valley now is you're ordering online off of your smartphone. Uh, you're at the table, they give you the website address for the menu, you order online, your food is served by a waiter, of course, and dishes are cleared by the waiter who is masked, and then uh, the check is presented uh, online as well, and you pay on your smartphone. So there's much less, much less touching of menus, touching of bills and checks and stuff like that 
it's uh, yeah, it is safer. And again, the tables are all socially distanced. The weather here is beautiful. Really, it's really nice here through uh, in Sonoma Valley uh, through the end of October. So there'll be uh, if we can get on top of the of COVID by by the end of November, uh, end of October rather, we should be in good shape because we can uh, go ahead with outside dining until then. Um, at the wineries, the tastings are also being done outside, and again. Almost every one of the major wineries has some outside seating area. Again, the groups are socially distanced. The tastings are done by a wine tasting expert that you know serves you, but it's done on a, a socially distanced private private basis. Now, Abercrombie and Kent only does private wine tastings, meaning that if you join us in any uh, trip to the wine country, you will never just be wandering into a tasting room and asked to taste with lots of other people up at the wine tasting bar or whatever. Uh, whether it's a COVID time or not, we always do private tastings. And uh, that means you'll be, right now, you'll be outside in a private area with the, your wine tasting uh, guide, usually the, one of the winemakers from the winery. Um, okay, let's go to the next one, Kirk. So see, these are some of the wine country accommodations that we'd like. There are certainly many, many more. There's probably uh, 15 different properties that we book, but these are some of our favorites. So starting with the Farmhouse Inn, one of the things that we like about Farmhouse Inn is that all the accommodations have outside doors and separate buildings. And so again, from a point, standpoint of safety now during the uh, COVID times, uh, we like to avoid the long hallways and elevators, et cetera. So the Farmhouse is really a great choice. It's in. Uh, the, it's in Sonoma County. It's not in Sonoma Valley. It's out toward the ocean uh, from Sonoma Valley. Uh, but there are many wonderful wineries around the farmhouse in, mostly doing Pinot Noir. Uh, they're in the little chillier area as you get closer to the ocean. Uh, on the, on the, uh, let me go down to the Meadowwood next. Meadowwood's a very famous property in Napa Valley uh, near St. Helena, California. Uh, Meadowwood is an expansive property of over 500 acres, and again, with private buildings and cottages that are separate from one another, outside entrances. Again, we really like this property for that, you know, for that reason. Um, on the lower right uh, is the Solage, which is a little less expensive property than Farmhouse and Meadowwood. Also in the Napa Valley, uh, a little further north of Meadowwood along uh, Highway 29. And a Solage is uh, has a has an extensive spa, a large outside uh, restaurant that's uh, that is very well known, and is very close to many of our favorite wineries. And I'll point some of those out as we go along. The last one I just wanted to mention is not one that we're booking a lot right now because it's more of a traditional hotel. Uh, it's located in the city of Napa. It's the Archer Hotel in the city of Napa. It's a four-story hotel. And it has a beautiful restaurant on its roof garden on the very top of the property. Um, this one has, you know, because it does have corridors and inside access, we're, we're using it less now, but it's a very hip property. And again, for younger people, uh, people who like to be in more of a small city rather than out in the countryside, Farmhouse, Meadowood, and Solage are all by themselves. Uh, Archer is in the town of Napa, so you know you have a walking distance, you have many restaurants, uh, tasting rooms, et cetera, and the hotel itself has a very nice restaurant, as I mentioned, on the top floor. So it's an, it's an a, alternative to the general style of, of uh, the other properties like Farmhouse, Meadowwood, and Solage. Okay. And then wine country activities. Uh, people come to wine country for wining and dining. They want to taste wines, they want to have great, great meals, but Typically, uh, we set people up to do their tastings and then uh, starting at about noon with a wine pairing lunch frequently, and then uh, one or two tastings after that in the afternoon, and then a really fine dinner at one of the good restaurants. But the mornings are typically for activities, and these are just some of the activities that are available. Uh, there's hiking. In this case, it was in an in a oak forest, but there's also uh, redwood. There's a redwood grove in Sonoma County, not too far, in fact, from the Farmhouse Inn which is a very, very popular for walks in the morning. The coast actually, uh, out, to the, out to the Pacific coast is only about oh, half an hour from Farmhouse and a little bit further from the Napa Valley, but the coast is another area that people like to go in the mornings for beach walks, et cetera. 
Uh, and then in the vines, both in the Sonoma and Napa Valley, we have horseback riding, biking, and hot air ballooning. So again, and hot air ballooning especially is done early in the mornings when uh, the winds are calmer. And uh, so this is the, typically the way the mornings work. You can either relax, go to the spa, uh, take it easy, or do one of these activities uh, to balance out the caloric intake that you'll have from, uh, from noon on, so, okay? And then we do private tastings, as I mentioned before. Uh, that was before COVID, but certainly during the COVID, we continue to do private tastings only. Uh, now, again, it's mostly outdoor tasting, although there's some on, you know, some are on decks and patios, some are out in the vines themselves, but it'll be done privately with just you and, the, and, and a winemaker, okay? So I've broken down the wineries just to give you some examples between moderate level, uh, luxury level, and cult level, let's say, just to give you a sense of it. I saw that you guys, uh, I didn't look at all of them, but I saw that Camus and um, Plum Jack were two of the wineries that were popular with some of you, and those are ones that we sometimes go to. When you're planning a trip to the wine country, if you have some wineries that you're particularly interested in because you enjoy those wines, we can arrange for private tastings at, at those wineries as well. Some of the ones that we include frequently, and I'll tell you why in each case, are the at the moderate level. And when I say moderate, that means prices in the, in the range from about $30 to uh, $80 or so in that price range. And uh, let me start with the Wellington Winery. That's a small winery in the Sonoma Valley. Um, not very well known. They make some really excellent Cabernets and Pinot Noirs. And it's a, it's a winery that's really gaining a lot more attention. Um, I think that they, they, they bottle under 2000 cases. So, I mean, it's a very small winery, but uh, one that I think is worth, worth uh, noting. I don't think you'd find it available in wine shops in Detroit or Chicago, but um, uh, you, know, you can become a member of any of these wineries and be able to uh, buy their wines through the, through the wine clubs. Um, St. Francis Vineyard is a larger winery, but the, one of the reasons we like it, it's a beautiful uh, physical space, and you see they're backed up against the, uh, what's called the Mayacamas Mountains in the background. So the tastings outdoors are on the backside, this is the front entrance, on the backside of St. Francis are just beautiful with all the surrounding vines and the mountains in the distance. Uh, St. Francis has an exceptional chef and kitchen. And so one of our favorites is to do a wine pairing lunches at St. Francis. And right now they're doing done outside uh, in a covered area. So you're not in the sun, it's a shaded outside area. Uh, and, then it, and then when they also have an inside uh, seating area as well uh, when, when COVID is over. Uh, Iron Horse Vineyards in the lower left is a champagne house or a sparkling wine house. Uh, in, again, the Sonoma County, it's not in the valley, it's out toward the ocean. They grow Chardonnay grapes for their, in the main for their, and some Pinots for their um, champagnes or their sparkling wines. Uh, this one is, has some really high quality wines, again, in that 30 to $100 price range. And um, they're kind of famous because every U.S. president from Ronald Reagan to Trump have used Iron Horse wines in state dinners. And in fact, I read that uh, President Trump had taken uh, Iron Horse uh, sparkling wines to France for a dinner that he was having there and introduced the French to our sparkling wine. So uh, I, we, we, love the, we love the wines. It's a beautiful setting on top of the hill looking out at, this whole, at the whole Sonoma Valley below. Peju Winery is in the Napa Valley, not too far from Meadowood, uh, not too far from Solage as, as well. And Peju, uh, we, we work with, they have very good wines. Again, Cabernet is one of their best uh, varietals. But they, uh, interestingly, uh, do uh, cooking classes. And sometimes the cooking classes are done indoors in their kitchen, but now they're doing cooking classes out in the vines. And they actually bring a wood-fired oven out into the vines, and you get to work with the chef and make creations out there literally in among the vines and have your picnic, or not your picnic, your, your uh, lunch that you've created out there surrounded by the vineyards. So it's a, a very interesting place and an interesting uh, cook, cooking class program. Okay, Kurt? 
So at the luxury level, uh, we have many wineries and uh, that we uh, can include. These are only three examples. Uh, the two on the bottom, well, the one on the bottom, Stag's Leap, and the other, Chateau Montalena, are famous because these were the two wineries that put forth the wines that were in the famous uh, Judgment of Paris. So I don't know if you guys know the Judgment of Paris story, but in 1976, a uh, English wine store owner came to California and bought a whole bunch of wine and took it back to a French tasting, uh, blind tasting in Paris in 1976. And the 1973 Chateau Montalena Chardonnay and the 1973 Stag Cabernet Sauvignon won the French tasting in 1976 and completely upset the French. That's why they call it the, the, um, uh, the what is it, is the name I'm forgetting right now. But anyway, the, they completely upset the French and that's what kind of put California wines on the map. You know, most People in certainly in Europe, but even in the East Coast, kind of poo-pooed uh, California wines until that time. Uh, there was a movie made about this called Bottle Shock in 2005, I think, or something. You could find it online. It's not a great movie, but it does tell the story of the uh, Judgment of Paris in 1976. So look for Bottle Shock uh, on uh, Netflix, and I think you'll find the story interesting. But when you go to taste wines, the, the Chardonnays at Chateau Montalena or the Cabernets at Stag's Leap, they'll tell you the whole story of the Judgment of Paris. Uh, and then Davis Estates is another winery we really love, has higher end wines in the $100 to $150 bottle range. Again, a focus on Cabernets. Okay, next. Uh, and then in terms of cult wineries, we have several cult wineries that we go to. Uh, and that we have relationships with. Uh, Harlan in the States, you may have heard of, is one of them. Uh, we sometimes um, will go to, um, uh, still have, I'm forgetting it now, the, um, well, I can't remember. But anyway, this is the one that we go to most often for cult wines, Promontory Winery. Promontory is a relatively new winery. They've only been, uh, their, their vines were planted about eight or nine years ago. Their first, uh, their, their first bottling was in, uh, in 2014, I believe, or 2015. Um, their wines sell in the $400 and up range. They only make Cabernet Sauvignon. It's on a beautiful hillside looking down at the Napa Valley. So the tastings are done in a gorgeous outdoor pavilion looking down. A uh, couple of things that they do that are interesting. Uh, the tastings, first of all, are done beautifully. Uh, as I say, at this outdoor pavilion, we often do wine pairing lunches. There, they have a catering kitchen and we can do beautiful private wine pairing lunches in the pavilion. We also, um, they also do uh, barrel tastings. So they'll take you down into the barrel room and they'll just tap off wine from uh, one, of their, one of their vintages so you can taste. And we often do vertical tastings at Promontory where uh, you'll get to taste, since the only wine they make is Cabernet Sauvignon, They'll, they'll do vertical tastings of different years of the, of the Cabernet. So you get a chance to see how the, how the wine changes year to year and how it ages over the years. Okay. And that's it. So that's kind of an overview of wine country. Uh, as I said, uh, you know, a day with us in wine country usually includes some activity in the morning. Uh, it includes a wine pairing lunch or a cooking class where you make your own lunch and, and paired with wines of that winery and then an afternoon tasting. And then in the evening, there, you know, it's a fabulous area for restaurants. We have many, you know, uh, several Michelin three-star restaurants, two-star restaurants and one-star restaurants. So there's a lot of choices in terms of the Michelin star restaurants. And then there's also many other wonderful restaurants that uh, are not Michelin starred, but are quite exceptional. So it's a great place to come for activity, wine and dine. Thank you so much, Marty. And thanks to the team for a great presentation. Um, we'll do some Q&A now. And as folks, you know, get ready to chime in, interrupt me at any time. But you answered a lot of the questions that I got in advance already in the presentation. So thank you for that. Um, one other question that maybe you can elaborate on a bit more is, you know, kind of what does it look like now there in Sonoma? How busy is it? 
Have you seen some trends even in the short term, say starting this summer with it getting busy, just to give our guests a sense of what they'll see and feel when they come? Okay, so right now it is not very busy in wine country. Uh, there is availability uh, at almost all the properties at any time you want. And I say right now, meaning through, you know, the first, through Labor Day, I would say. But after Labor Day begins the crush season in wine country. And so, you know, crush is a time when people want to come because in addition to tasting wonderful wines, you get to see the whole processing of the wines. And, you know, it used to be that, of course, you could go inside to some of the, some of the crush facilities and outside. Now it's outside only, but honestly, most of the wineries are doing a, a, a giant portion of what they do in the crush outside. Certainly the picking of the grapes is an outside activity, but even now the, you know, the actual, uh, you know, uh, selection of the grapes, uh, the, the, the de-stemming and the crushing is all done in machines that are out of, out of doors. So you could actually watch the whole process. But there, you, uh, this year they've canceled what does still exist, which is the old fashioned Lucille Ball, crush the grapes with your feet thing. A couple of wineries just for fun offer that and we can arrange for you. This year we can't, but in general, we're able to arrange for even reliving the, the Lucille Ball, crush the grapes thing, which a couple of the wineries do. Um, so it's going to be more crowded in the crush season, Kareem. And I, I know that because we've been booking people for the crush and we've had some sold out dates. So I think again, people love the crush season in any case. And this year, because people held back on traveling, uh, you know, during the summer, uh, the fall is becoming sort of explosive uh, in terms of people uh, feeling ready and getting out. And because I think wine country has a really good reputation in how it's handling uh, the Corona virus, uh, as I mentioned before, some of the some of the care that's being taken, I think it's considered a relatively safe destination. And, uh, you know, so that, that's, a, that's made it more crowded. So I think it will, you know, I think there is still some room. I mean, if, you know, if you have one or two couples, let's say traveling together, uh, I don't think a group trip would be as successful right now, just because it'd be tough to, you know, to get five to 10 rooms at, at once in, in the nicer properties. Yeah. Thank you. I also should say I love the wine country at other times of the year, though, too. I mean, out, it, it, besides the summer and the crush, uh, you know, the springtime, I think, is a wonderful time. Even the winter, you know, I've been in the wine country at all all seasons. And there, you know, in the fall, during the crush time, we start to get the leaves. You know, first of all, the crush happens and the grapes are picked. And then November, December, we start to see the, the, the fall colors of the of, of, the, of the vineyards, which is quite amazing. I mean, the vineyards turn yellow and red and orange. So you have like a mosaic of the of vines themselves turning colors. And then in January, February, the mustard starts to bloom between the vine, between the rows of vines because they often grow mustard as a nitrogen fixer for, you know, for the grapes. And so you have this, all this beautiful yellow blossoming in the January, February timeframe. And then uh, the spring comes in March, and then we start to get, you know, flowers. Lots of the vineyards are growing flowers around for decoration. So it's really beautiful at all times. So probably the least crowded is winter, and then next would be spring. Uh, but uh, those are wonderful times to come, a little bit less crowded, uh, but still um, great wines to taste, great restaurants to go to, and, um, you know, lots of color of its own between the mustard and the flowers. Yeah. Thanks, Marty. I think that's a great, you know, a great point, Marty and and uh, and Kareem, is that you know there are year round some, you know, year round destinations. And what's nice is that you know people may have an idea um, in their mind of what their experience should be and when the time of year, you know, they should go is. But we're able to create interesting. Um, experiences year round in some of these destinations, you know, as Marty said, you can see he's really got great insight there. And of course, I think, you know, we can all agree that uh, the wine tasting and the culinary experiences in that area are, <laughs> it doesn't matter what time of year you go. And that's, that's another thing too, is that Marty and the team and Kurt can, you know, everything we do is customized, you guys. So whatever your tastes are, whatever your interests are, we'll design 
a journey. We'll make our recommendations and we'll design it to your personal tastes. And, you know, with that in mind, we were able to, you know, connect with um, several of the, you know, Michelin star experiences, you know, dining experiences as well and help you orchestrate those and, you know, just pay attention to every single detail of the trip from the time you land in California to the time you leave. And there are some really special kinds of uh, experiences. I mean, you know, I mentioned a few of them, the, the, the cooking classes and making your own lunches and everything. Uh, we, we have that, but we also have beautiful um, dinners in wine caves where you, you know, we, we can uh, get some nice music. It could be a violin player or someone else, you know, somebody else, a jazz, jazz, you know, jazz uh, singer or whatever. And then you know you have the beautiful echoing off the walls of the of, of the cave, beautiful table to enjoy with your to enjoy a beautiful meal with your catered meal with your friends, wine paired with the you know with wine um, knowledge by the winemaker from that winery. So there's lots of those kind of you know special events. You can even do the blend your own wine. We have a couple of wineries that you know will help you create your own label and your own wine blend to uh, try your luck at uh, and your your skill at uh, creating your own your own uh, vintage varietal wine so uh, there's lots of those kinds of experiences that we can we can create one thing i wanted to mention when i talked to kareem yesterday he mentioned i should tell you this and that is you know you can do self-drive from san francisco airport out to the wine country and then have a car for your let's say in the mornings to travel to uh, some of the activities that you might want to do, like the horseback riding or hot air ballooning. But the one, th one, pl one time when we don't allow you to uh, use your own vehicle is when we are going wine tasting. So, uh, you know, from noon or so on through the afternoon when you're going to uh, wine pairing lunch and then one or two tastings, you have to go with one of our driver guides. You'll still have local winemakers that will uh, greet you and work with you at each of the wineries. But because of uh, just wanting you to be free to do as much wine tasting as you want and not have to worry about driving, uh, we insist on our driver guides for the tastings in the afternoons and also for dinners in the evenings. If you're gonna to go to a distance to dinner, uh, if we make the arrangements for the dinners, then you, know, you have to do it with our driver guide. If uh, again, you know, what you do on your own is your own business, but most of our clients I say do, you know, do, um, uh, rent cars to go from San Francisco to the wine country, but then they are with us with driver guides a good part of the time whenever they're doing tastings or meals. Great, thanks for that, Marty. Super, well, if there are not further questions from anyone, and I just checked the chat as well, I think again, kudos to our presenters for doing such a great job and being so informative. So I just want to thank Kim and Marty and Kirk again for joining us today and all of you for tuning in and spending part of your afternoon, early evening with us. And hopefully we'll see each other soon in wine country or elsewhere. Thanks for setting it up, Kareem. It was a really nice, beautiful photography. Oh, thank you, Jim. Thank you for thank joining you. us. Thanks so much. We hope to see you guys soon. Enjoy your evening and, um, Cheers, Kareem. And ah, yes, I wish I had my glass too. Cheers, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.